decided to change my ways. Welcome back to the Leaving Eden podcast. We are your hosts, Sadie Carpenter. As always, cult expert, cult survivor is here with you today. And my name is Gabrielle Hakoan. I survived purity culture and we're going to talk about it. Today we are talking about I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Uh, which, Sadie, do you want to talk about what this book is and, and what this book meant to the evangelical movement? Yeah, absolutely. I Kiss Dating Goodbye is a book by Joshua Harris. It was published first in 1997, and it is the seminal text of 2000s evangelical purity culture. Before this book came out, we had the True Love Waits movement. Purity rings were already a thing. The idea of not having sex until marriage was very common among evangelicals. But this book widely popularized some of the most toxic ideas of purity culture, like the slippery slope idea and the guard your heart idea, the give the pieces of your heart away, that concept. This book didn't invent any of this, and it didn't invent purity culture, but it birthed an entire era of it. Yeah, I got the sense from reading this book that these were a bunch of ideas that already existed, and this was just kind of a compilation of those into one thing. Yes, with a handsome young face on the back and written from a peer perspective and late 90s and early 2000s evangelical teenagers really ate it up. Next week, actually, we are going to be talking, I guess, not entirely about Joshua Harris as well, but his ex-wife, Shannon Harris, has written a book called The Woman They Wanted. And we've both read that book and we both loved it. We both thought it was fantastic as far as deconstruction memoirs go. And so next week we're going to be talking about the woman they wanted. So this is, it isn't quite a two-parter, but this is a. It's a duplex of episodes. (laughs) A duplex of episodes. I like that, but it's, that was a fantastic book. Much better than this one. Yes. Then again, she was also an adult when she wrote it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah this episode um i think we're gonna be pretty fair we're not here to bury josh harris or to praise him um we're just gonna have an honest conversation about um this book the harms of this book but also what he has done after writing this book yeah uh, it's also worth noting uh before we get into actually talking about the book itself that joshua harris the author of this book is now an atheist and completely disavows everything that he wrote in it. And he also participated in in a documentary about where this book came from, where the ideas in it came from, where he actually went back and tried to find the, uh, is etymology the right word? The genesis, if you will, of these ideas, no pun intended. We have not seen that documentary, but I would love to take a look at that. Also, Joshua Harris got called out in Ginger Duggar's book, Becoming Free Indeed, and she described him as, quote, the leader of the deconstruction movement. (laughs) And if you were involved in the firestorm of snark surrounding his deconstruction course, we're going to get to all of that. (laughs) Yeah, as far as like scammy courses, are we going to, uh, how do we feel about his course versus Bethany Beale's course? Or do we not want (laughs) to step on that beehive again? (laughs) I have a lot to say about his course, um, but I'm going to save that for the end of the episode. Yes, uh, it is worth noting that even Joshua Harris recognizes how absurd and ridiculous the content of this book is. So without further ado, the Leaving Eden podcast is the podcast about my BFF and co-host Sadie Carpenter's life in and escape from the independent fundamental Baptist cult, the cult in which she was raised. We talk about this cult. We talk about other cults. We talk about religion. We talk about fundamentalism. We talk about the real and present threat that cults and cult ideologies pose to society as a whole. And it is our goal to promote freedom of mind, freedom of thought, and freedom of religion. So if you like our show, if you are a fan of our show, there are some things that you can do to support us. You can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash leaving eden podcast where you will get an extended and uncensored and ad free version of this episode as well as many other episodes and you can listen to the episode that we had the valentine's day special um that came out last wednesday that where we reviewed a 
marriage book written by a convicted pedophile who was a pastor, uh, Jack Scop. It was not a very good marriage book, but we had good fun reading it. And that's available on our Patreon for our patrons. You can also join our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Eden Exodus, where you can join in the discussion. We also have a subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash Eden Exodus. Both great places to have discussion about religion, deconstruction. If you want to share some memes, we talk about like Christian nationalism in there. We talk about, you know, anything that can be lighthearted, you know, very emotional, very vulnerable. And generally our discussions in that Facebook group have been extremely I want to say thoughtful and compassionate forward mm-hmm. rather than people, you know, jumping down each other's throats like you see on a lot of other pages, which has really been a nice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, stuff happens on the internet. Um, <laughs> some people are not nice on the internet, but for a group of the size that we have, I think our members do a really good job as a whole of keeping things nice on our page. That being said, if you have attempted to join our Facebook group and you got turned down from entering the Facebook group, try again and make sure you answer the membership questions. We have those membership questions so that we can hold everybody to a standard of kind online behavior and make it as safe of a space as we can (laughs) to talk about these things. So if if you have tried to get in the Facebook group and weren't able to, that is 99.9% most likely why. So try again and make sure you answer the the membership questions. Yeah, I mean, if you want an example of like just how generally unproblematic our Facebook group is, the number of posts that have ever been reported in the history of the group, I want to say it's less than like 15. I would have said 10 or 11 maybe. Yeah, maybe like if we yeah. get up, if somebody reports something to us who are the moderators of the group, Rob, like, whoa, this is somebody must have done something crazy. <laughs> no, but um, really, uh, yeah, we do. We do love that group. Uh, anyway, I just want to thank our patrons. Uh, and, and I want to start with our I gave it all to your patrons and our I gave it all to your patrons. Your names are I'm not 1010. Really, you're not 1010. Okay, I thought you were, but cool. Kathleen Moncrief, uh, Melissa Manown. Uh, also, congratulations, Mazel Tov, on getting married, uh, Melissa. Congratulations, Melissa. We're so happy um, to hear that from you, uh, Mazel Tov. We have Melora King, and we have Todd Dale on behalf of his lovely Deconstruct Arena of a wife, Madeline Antrim. Thank you guys so much for being our I Gave It All to Your Patrons our Faith Promise Missions tier patrons, your names are Alex P., Allie Allen, Autumn of Our Discontent, Brittany, Chrissa, uh, Chrissa Walker, Dora J., Eleanor Donahue, Hannah Ross, Hannah Montana, Hope Norum, Horton, Here's a Shane, Janine Collin, Jana Connor, new patron, Jana Connor, thank you so much, Jen Kaharski, Jessica Tambo, Jonna, Kat Henwood, K. Tur, we, Kristen Marie, Learned Vixen, Linda Morgan, Madeline Antrim, Madeline Cusick, Marlena Stuve, Marsha Millard, Mary Williams, Mary Martin, Megan Arendt, Melissa G., Morgs, Rob the Methodist, Stephanie Johnson, Steve and Amy, Susie, Tara, Mac, Namara, and Wes the Cowboy. Thank you guys so much for subscribing at the Faith Promise Missions tier of our Patreon. Love you, love you, love you, love you, love you, and we love all of our patrons and anybody who supports our show in non-financial ways, even just by sharing it with your friends, your family, anyone you know who you think you might like it. Yeah, thank you so much, especially to our I Gave It All tier and Faith Promise Missions tier patrons, but to all of you and all of our supporters, we have a show because we have an incredible audience. Thank you so much. Sadie is going to hit us with a TW, and then we are going to get into the episode. In general, we talk about a lot of potentially triggering topics on this show, including but not limited to suicide and mental health, racism, misogyny, PTSD, and PTSD symptoms, child abuse, mental, physical, and sexual abuse, and spiritual abuse, including guilt, shame, and fear. In most episodes, we will mention at least a few of these topics, 
but we avoid graphic detail unless it's relevant to the story that we're telling and we give our audience a heads up if we are going to include any of that graphic detail. This episode is all about purity culture. We will be talking about uh, purity culture, true love's true love waits, modesty, and there will be very brief mentions of sexual violence with no details given. So how do we want to start? Sadie, uh, were you when you grew up, did you read this book? Or was this book too worldly for the IFB? I am really not sure if I read this book. Hmm. I know that sounds kind of crazy. <laughs> like reading through it for the podcast, it sounded super familiar. But it's really hard to know if it sounded familiar because I read it as a teenager or if it sounded familiar because it's just all the same purity culture stuff. Right, because we read Dating with a Purpose. How similar are those two books? They're kind of similar, except for I I felt like after having read this book now, Dating with a Purpose feels like Jack Scop plagiarized whole chapters out of I Kiss Dating Goodbye and then threw in a couple like, here's why you should go to Hiles Anderson and here's why I'm the best. Here's why Jack Hiles is the best. Here's a weird sermon illustration about youths playing cops and robbers or something like that. <laughs> so I looked it up. Um, Dating with a Purpose came out in January of 1994. So not plagiarized from... I kiss dating goodbye. Oh, so that predates this. Interesting. Because I remember when we read uh, Dating with a Purpose, you mentioned I kiss dating goodbye and how Dating with a Purpose was like the fundy version of I kiss dating, go- or dating goodbye. Yes. So Josh Harris is not an IFB fundy. His parents were, in, I think he, his parents were involved in the Christian homeschooling movement they were not um, strictly IBLP, they were not IFB fundy, but they were a brand of Christian that would run very close to both of those groups. Joshua was the first of seven children of Greg and Sono Harris, who were pioneers in the Christian homeschooling movement that was taking shape in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, And because his parents were so prominent within this movement, Joshua was well-connected and primed for leadership within Christian evangelical circles. So he was sort of seen as like a rising star as a teenager. He was the publisher and he was the editor of New Attitude, which was a magazine for Christian homeschool teens. So he had this big platform and then he could write books and sell these Christian books to the people who would have been reading his magazine, New Attitude. In The Woman They Wanted, which is the memoir of his ex-wife, Shannon, he was depicted during the time when he was writing this book as almost like a pop star within that branch of evangelical Christianity. Shannon depicts him as somebody who was sort of groomed for this level of leadership among Christian and, and Christians and Christian teens. And despite his lack of life experience, he was seen as somebody who he's sort of portrayed as somebody who has who like thinks he has all of the answers, despite not being able to comprehend the stakes of some of the questions that he might be being asked to answer. Yes, this is the the Christian homeschool movement that did educate children or in at least in some families did give their children a better quality education than ACE is what I'm saying. (laughs) Joshua, as a very young guy writing this book, believe he started writing it when he was 19 and published it at 21, if I'm correct. There was some discrepancy online about his exact age, which is a little odd. But he writes well, he writes articulately, and he has no clue what he's talking about. some of the, the the stories in the book that are not about him are hypotheticals because he does not have the life experience to even claim that he has real stories about these things. The thing that I think is really important to point out is, of course, he thought he had all the answers. Of course he did, because he was told uh, his entire life that he did have all the answers. When I was 16, I absolutely thought I could write a book 
um, about this type of topic, something Christian life related or, or roughly, theolo- you know, loosely theologically related, um, I absolutely thought I was qualified for that at the same age. <laughs> Because we were told, people like me and people like Josh Harris were told, you know the truth. You have the answers that all of those other people out in the world don't have. The the thing is that he bought it for a bit longer than I did. (laughs) Yeah, if I were being charitable to Joshua Harris, I would describe this book as Ivory Tower. If I were being... I think maybe a little bit more honest. I would describe this as this guy has no f-ing clue what he is talking about. Mm-hmm. Would you maybe characterize him at the time of writing I Kiss Dating Goodbye as highly intelligent and highly gullible? Yes. I think that's fair to say. And there is there is a definite type of person who is like that. I read somewhere, and I do not know if this is accurate or not, um, so please don't come for me on the internet, but I read somewhere that Einstein was huge into buying like pop culture magazines because magazine salespeople would come by his door and he couldn't say no to them. There mm-hmm. is a There's a definite type of person that is very, very intelligent in one area and then can be very gullible in other areas of their life. Right. And also, I should just say, writing a book at 21, even if it's filled with complete nonsense, is still kind of an achievement. And this book is nonsense, but it is also better written and more persuasively written and more interesting to read than anything we've read by Jack Scott so far. Yeah, or many of the other books that are written. I mean, it's better than uh, Kent Hovind's dissertation, which was a (laughs) complete mess yes it is it is organized into chapters that make sense another detail that i think it's important to point out before we get into the content of this book is that in the woman they wanted it becomes a uh, shannon harris makes it even more clear that this book wasn't just a production of the evangelical and homeschool culture that harris was raised in but it also contains significant influence from cj mahaney who was the pastor of Covenant Life Church and and Sovereign Grace Ministries, which and and he was deemed to be very controlling, uh, covered up sexual abuse within those ministries. But that denomination is a denomination of uh, uh, reformed charismatic churches. The impression that I got as far as vibe goes is that they're similar to like Hillsong, but they're also five point tulip Calvinists. And so they're not Pentecostal like Hillsong would be Pentecostal, but they're they're charismatic. And they also focus very heavily on the T in tulip as in total depravity. So this book is kind of operating from the premise of you are sinful and you will do and act evil. Understanding that kind of context makes the content of this book make a lot more sense. Yes. So anything that you want is probably sinful. In reading this book, I have to keep reminding myself that this is coming from a culture where kids are getting married at uh, 20, 21, 22, 23. 25 at the oldest. So dating is not something that you see people doing throughout their 20s casually and then they get serious when they're in their late 20s, early 30s, which I think is how a lot of people tend to date, you know, out in the secular world. Although now I think people are more, you know, the age at which people are getting more serious about who they're dating gets later and later, or at least that's the impression that I've gotten. So dating is like, deemed a phase of your life that is super temporary and it's only a thing in like your late teens and early 20s and it's something that you're gonna kind of get over with so that's also kind of the mindset that you have to go into when you're reading this book so i don't want to start with the like at the very beginning of this book uh but i want to start with a story that joshua harris tells near the beginning of this book oh absolutely where he describes uh his first ever real relationship with his first ever real girlfriend when he was uh 16 17 he says that they would talk to each other constantly they would stay up all night talk on the phone but because they could not be as close physically as they were emotionally 
tension developed and they had to break up. And so this is what he says here. Uh, The quote is, I was 17 years old when my relationship with Kelly ended. My dreams of romance had ended in compromise, bitterness, and regret. I walked away asking, is this how it has to be? I felt discouraged, confused, and desperate for an alternative to the cycle of short-term relationships in which I found myself. God, I cried, I want your best for my life. Give me something better than this. Any thoughts on that quote? He gave a piece of his heart away. I will I will note, because we can't be as close physically as we are emotionally, tension developed, that is very much something that I heard growing up. That's really interesting. This is in, that's in Dating with a Purpose. So that's an idea that predates this. So that's like one of those things that would have been floating around. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like Harris's problems with dating here more often than not stem from an inability to emotionally regulate or to learn to accept disappointment, which also might have something to do with him writing this book at 21 about experiences that he had between the ages of 17 and 20. And the constraints that are put on relationships by conservative evangelicalism and his religious upbringing, rather than being focused on, okay, this is what actually dating successfully is going to to look like. And this is how you should work to form relationships, you know, in a, a, where, so there's mutual respect and, you know, that you're getting your needs met. He is always framing heartbreak as a failure. If you have sad feelings, because a relationship has come to an end, then you went too far in that relationship mentally or physically, one way or the other. It's almost got toxic positivity coding into that. Yes. So if you feel heartbroken, you have failed and you're a bad person. Uh, can I uh, read a quote from the forward? Because this yep. is also kind of insane, uh, but this will give you. Go, kind you of go some ahead. I'll get over the Sadie triggered herself again. <laughs> <laughs> Sadie triggered herself. Oh, that one okay. sucked. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, dude. Yeah. Oof. So the foreword is written by uh, Joshua Harris's friend Rebecca St. James. Rebecca writes, "I'm so glad this book is in your hands. It could save you from a lot of needless agony. It has the potential to change the mindset of our generation. It already has affected my life. Let me explain. You see, for a long time, I have held the same kind of opinions on dating as Josh, the writer of this book and a friend of mine. I mean, as someone said to me recently, why shop if you're not going to buy? Exactly. Why date if you can't marry yet? I'm 19, and even though I've never dated, I've had plenty of years to watch some of my friends at the game. And believe me, it is a game, and it doesn't look fun. It looks agonizing and painful. That's part of the reason I haven't dated. So the foreword to this book is written by somebody who has never dated, and she's like, this is the best book on dating ever. And you say, well, how do you know? Have you implemented the techniques? And she's like, yes, because I haven't dated. Uh. <laughs> this is just, this is like the entire idea going forward for this book is we have no experience, but we know that you're doing everything wrong. Right. And and I think you were really smart to point out that it is root, rooted in the total depravity doctrine because I am never a person to demean young love. When they use words like agony, that's not something I want to make fun of beyond having a little smile over it. Because I, I've i been 17, I've been 18, it wasn't that long ago. It can be, like young love can be agony. It can be an incredibly intense emotional experience. I think where they're going, where Rebecca and Joshua are both going wrong this early in the book is equating that agony to there being something wrong with you or something you've done wrong rather than a very natural part of life. The feeling that I get from this book is like just from the forward, one, it's written by somebody who hasn't dated and two, it's somebody who wants you to know that they haven't dated because they're afraid of everything that can go wrong. And the fear is definitely a 
strong point in this book where he's just like, look at all of the things that can go wrong. And I want to write a, I, I want to read another quote from this book uh, where Harris is telling a story about a, I don't know if this is a true story or if this is just a, a sermon illustration that he's making, but he's telling a story about a young woman named Anna. This is a sermon illustration. This is pretend. This is entirely fake. The, yeah. n- this is not a, a, a not a real person, but the, a young woman named Anna. She's dreaming of her wedding day, and as she is at the altar with the minister um, and her uh, bridegroom David, uh, quote: "The unthinkable happened. A girl stood up in the middle of the congregation, walked quietly to the altar, and took David's other hand." Another girl approached and stood next to the first, followed by another. Soon, a chain of six girls stood by him as he repeated his vows to Anna. Anna felt her lip beginning to quiver as tears welled up in her eyes. Is this some kind of joke? She whispered to David. I'm I'm sorry, Anna, he said, staring at the floor. Who are these girls, David? What is going on? She gasped. They're girls from my past, he answered sadly. Anna, they don't mean anything to me now. But I've given a part of my heart to each of them. I thought your heart was mine, she said. It is. It is, he pleaded. Everything that's left is yours. Tears rolled down Anna's cheek. Then she woke up. Betrayed. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, as much, but like as much as I want to laugh at the silliness of something like this being printed in the book, because this feels like a parody Tumblr post. It is disturbing to me that the idea that your future husband may have loved somebody else in the past is represented here as literally a nightmare. It's religiously justified jealousy and possessiveness, which I think are not necessarily healthy in a relationship. But this book portrays like premarital sex and premarital heartbreak as like the number one most damaging thing that you can do to yourself and that the trauma from those things from you doing those things is trauma that you can never ever 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 in a million years recover from it is it is the idea that your physical body and your capacity to love are both finite resources and if you give any of that away at any time you do not get it back you cannot find more these things are finite and once it's gone it's gone so it is portraying premarital sex or heartbreak as a literal loss of a part of yourself it is 100 percent literal and tangible when you believe this way if you have sex you have or if you get too emotionally involved with someone and have your heart broken you have lost a part of yourself and harris at the time of writing this book had never had premarital sex um he's just repeating but he felt heartbreak and it didn't feel good and it felt bad enough to confirm his belief that he had lost a part of himself he's just repeating based on that confirmation bias what he's been told by his leaders his youth pastor whoever's books he's reading he was wrong and now he would admit that but i think one i think another key thing to remember is that at this point he really did believe that premarital sex and heartbreak were the worst possible trauma that you could inflict upon yourself And this book is just chock full of stories about high schoolers and young adults and uh, what he calls the dating game trademark. Breaking up, having sex, not having sex, being emotionally scarred, generally having a bad time. And these stories feel very low stakes to me. Of course, like if you're a teenager in that position, it feels very high stakes. To Joshua Harris, who views having to break up with his beautiful taller than him girlfriend at 17 as the worst thing that could ever happen to him these are like horror stories this book is just like sermon illustration after sermon illustration after sermon illustration about why the dating game trademark is bad the other thing i see here is a guy who is viewing happy moments in other people's lives from the outside where he doesn't 
get to have these moments because he's in a constant state of anxiety that he will give a piece of his heart away. So he speaks from a position of envy and insecurity and narrates a story in which all of the people who are happy now will see repercussions for their decisions later because if they don't, then he has wasted all of his years in his life. So he has to kind of tell himself that those people are having a bad time. I don't know. All of these sermon illustrations give very strong and everybody clapped vibes. You know when you are mad about something and you make up an argument in your head and then you win the argument? Yeah. And no offense to men, but it is very much a man thing to not only have that argument in your head, I think everybody does that, but then to put it into a printed book is very, uh, reads very man to me. And also to be like 19 and think you have the answers to everything and not to sh on men that, that will bravado and reckless abandon and doing things you're not qualified for from people of all genders has been a major driving force in moving humanity forward. It's just that sometimes that bravado and that drive brings you Marie Curie or Alexander Graham Bell. And sometimes it brings you, I kiss dating goodbye. <laughs> it's fine if you want to write down your thoughts and your feelings and, and like catalog them so you can look back at them later and think, oh, that was pretty good. Saying, I'm going to write these down and put them in a book so other pe people can read them. Maybe that's not. So that other teenagers won't kiss each other. The, also, like the way he writes is so weird. Uh, and maybe it's just because the cover of this book has a fedora guy on it. But Joshua Harris writes like the guy that wears a suit jacket to class and posts i was born in the wrong generation memes on the internet he was that guy <laughs> like at this point in his life he was that guy i you know reading through this book he quotes sereno de Bergerac. he quotes like <laughs> the people that he quotes he quotes elizabeth elliot the people that he speaks about his writing style he is a hundred percent that fedora guy and it's a good thing that he was really good looking when he was young because <laughs> that's how he got away with it he's really into posting the stoicism memes <laughs> yeah yeah i mean all of this is kind of it's it's really interesting because having so so sitting down to prep for this episode i was so ready to just rip him to shreds and then having read the book having read shannon's book having done some more research, that's not really the direction I wanted to go. We are going to rip the book to shreds because it is that is a worthwhile endeavor. But Harris himself, I really feel like he was just so sincere. Poor little baby, 19, 20, 21 year old. <laughs> and now he will spend the rest of his life trying to get away from that. I'm happy ripping on 21 year old Josh Harris because frankly, like 40, whatever year old Josh Harris likes to rip on 21 year old Josh Harris these days as well. Yeah. I just, I think I'm a little, I'm a little gentler than I could be because I'm convinced of his sincerity from in this time capsule from almost 30 years ago. So the, the main problem that, uh, that, with dating that Josh Harris is trying to point out is that if you give a piece of your heart away to somebody that you don't get married to, you have less of your heart left for your future spouse, which is, of course, ridiculous because love doesn't subtract, love multiplies. Uh, thank you for that, Dinah House Fire, for saying that. Uh, I've been using that quote since. And if somebody loves you enough that you would be happy marrying them, then surely there's enough love to go around. But there is just so much time spent harping on people who feel guilty because they had sex with somebody before they met the person they got married to and rather than say oh you shouldn't feel guilty about that it's yeah you f***ed up and you should feel bad you totally let them down and they're never going to be happy with you and they're just going to like have to settle for a less good version of whatever it is that your marriage could have been yeah less of you as you are less of yourself as a human being yeah and it's very much like let this be a warning to everybody else if you f up you will regret it for the rest of your life and you will never live it down and no one will ever let you live it down 
Well, this comes up in The Woman They Wanted as well, um, because Shannon was not a virgin uh, when she married Josh. And it was a whole church controversy about, is the pastor even going to let her marry him? And that's really disgusting, that that would even be a topic for conversation among people. I mean, it comes to me, like, it reminds me of, do you remember when Paul and Morgan were doing videos where they would discuss ad nauseum the fact that Morgan was not a virgin when she met Paul and got yes. married? And the vibe was totally weird, and they, it, they felt like it was something that they had to sort of almost explain and apologize for to all of their listener, to all of their their audience, mm -hmm. and something that she had to justify and be like, "Oh, well, I was in a really emotionally vulnerable state, so otherwise I wouldn't have done it." And it was, I'm just like, dude, right? And all of these people are within the religion that is the, the entire religion is built on the idea of. Everybody does bad shit, but Jesus's grace, forgiveness, redemption is enough to cover all of the bad shit that anybody has ever done, unless you're Calvinist, in which case Jesus's forgiveness and redemption is only enough to cover the bad shit that the people who are chosen have done. <laughs> uh, limited atonement. I hate limited atonement. Uh, my apologies to anybody who believes in and practices that theology in a compassionate way i haven't run into you yet i really hate limited atonement we had the listener who wrote in um who was it that wrote in? we had two or three we, people i think who, who spoke about like something like oh if you want to know god then you're one of the elect then that's fine like if you want to be saved that if you want to go to heaven then you're one of the mm -hmm. elect yeah, we had some people write us about different, more compassionate forms and understandings of Calvinism Reformed theology. Yeah, go back and check that. I don't know what number episode that was, but we wrote a we did that about the same time that we talked about Ginger's book becoming free indeed, because which was uh, January then, of twenty twenty three. Right. Jan so yeah, so it would have been January, February 2023. Really interesting episode. Calvinism, theologically very interesting. Not the theology for me. Thank you very much. I think I, I went into it a lot more in that episode, but the the part that actually bothers me worse than unconditional election is limited atonement, which is the idea that there's only so much Jesus to go around. <laughs> And you're very universalist personally, so that is kind of like diametrically opposed. <laughs> yeah, I came from a unlimited atonement theological background, and then now I am, I call myself a pseudo-universalist. It's complicated, but I'm very, very close to full universalism uh, at this point in my theological journey. <laughs> so, Can I go and read another quote from this book? Yes. Because uh, I, I want to move on to the next pitfall that Joshua Harris has a problem with. Um, and this is a pitfall that I will say this is valid. And this pitfall is that when you are dating, you end up going out with a lot of insincere people. And here's a quote from Joshua Harris where he says, My friends and I would go out with girls and break up with them at a frightening pace. The only worry was being dumped. You never wanted to get dumped. You wanted to be the one who did the dumping. One girl I knew had the fastest breakup routine ever. When she was ready to end a relationship, she'd say, Skippity Bop, you just got dropped. I, I, <laughs> did this really happen? <laughs> What is this line? I don't believe this. Sadie was like, I wonder if people, how people would react if we tried to get Joshua Harris on the podcast. And we're like, I don't know. But now that I've read that line, I'm like, I want to get him on the podcast so I can get like a fact or fiction on Skippity Bop, you just got dropped. I want to know if that was for real or if that was Cap. Okay. You know what? If you want to reach out to his people... <laughs> <laughs> he has people okay so i uh, so seriously though before i researched this episode there is no way i would have ever had him on the podcast and after researching this episode and reading shannon's book i would consider it i'd rather have shannon on the podcast honestly oh, absolutely i mean she's she's got a lot to say <laughs> If Shannon, if any of you guys know Shannon Harris and uh, uh, want to shoot her a line from us any day of the week 
Um, I'll clear my schedule so that we can have an interview with Shannon Harris because her story is fantastic. Go read her book. But if we're giving the skippity bop you just got dropped a one to ten on the Costanza mometer, if like so the the girlfriend who refuses to be broken up with is a one, and the it's not you, it's me is a five. And the preemptive breakup to get hand is a 10. Where do we rank Skippity Bop? You just got dropped. Hmm. <laughs> Perfectly timed meow from the cat. I feel like it's off the meter because it is not real. Because if somebody said that to you, you it would not register that this is a breakup line. No. It wouldn't make sense. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's just been that long since I was dating. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm just old. <laughs> I mean, also, I mean, if this was the 90s and catchphrases were really, really big in the 90s. Like we had all the like when we watched Clueless, it was yeah, as okay. if, you know, for, with uh, a, a share from from Clueless. And I, I mean, catchphrases were were really big around this time. I, I don't know. Don't I don't know. really remember 1997. Neither do I. I was four. The problem that Harris has with dating that you go that you end up going out with insincere, emotionally immature, and selfish people. I don't think that this is a problem that you can hand wave away because that is a serious problem. However, this is a problem that whether or not you're adhering to the purity rules, and even if you get married to somebody fully following the purity culture rules, the the Christian dating that he outlines in this book. You could be marrying somebody who is dishonest, who doesn't value you, who views you less than a fully formed human with independent thoughts and feelings. And we've read many a fundamentalist marriage book that has made these things very clear. And he echoes kind of those same sentiments there. Here's another quote from this book where he says, one cannot own somebody outside of marriage. In God's eyes, two married people become one. And as you continue to mature, you'll often crave the oneness that comes from sharing life with somebody. Perhaps you feel that desire even now. Yet I believe that until we're ready to commit our lives in marriage, we have no right to treat anyone as if he or she belongs to us. Which is weird because he's saying you can't own somebody unless you're married to them and then they belong to you. You can't own somebody would maybe have been a better point. That was kind of a Jack Scott move. Um, the the basic premise is kind of okay, and then it goes a weird direction. The way that he views marriage is that when you get married to somebody, you then belong to that person, and that's like permanent. You, that person could be just as disingenuous as if you were dating somebody Outside, I mean, in many ways, I think that this problem may be worse within purity culture than outside of it, because outside of purity culture, you could end up in a situationship or you could be casually dating somebody who is mainly interested in sex and maybe you go out to bars and movies sometimes. But this person doesn't really value you that much. And if you wanted to get serious, they wouldn't be in. And you both know that. And you both know what you're getting out of it. In purity culture, you don't do the sex. So like all of what you've got to share with somebody is the emotional side of things. And so when people are disingenuous and unserious about the emotional side of things, that seems like that could be potentially so much more damaging. Yeah, and also when when your goal is marriage so that you can have sex. Like you got to you got to you want to have sex so you got to get married so that you can have sex, but you view owning another human person as something that comes along with the marriage and the sex when you sign the marriage license. That's a that's not setting people up for success. No. It really that's isn't. Rough. Oh, that just it that really bugs me personally because I don't want to think of myself as owning my husband or my kid. You know, I own my toothbrush. My my family members are not things that I possess. And I think it really it really rubs on my personal trauma from patriarchy because I was told that I was a thing that was possessed by a person. 
and then would later be given to and possessed by another person. And that's a that's a tough trauma to shake. So I think this really this one irritates me on that level. You are totally justified in that reaction to this. And I think that's more than fair. Can I read another quote, which I think is very gross? So Harris says, while in high school, I attended a weekend church retreat in which we discussed the topic of sexual purity. During one session, our pastor asked all of us students to anonymously fill out survey cards that would let him know how far the kids in the group had gone physically. He provided a rough scale for us to use assigning numbers to level of physical intimacy based on their seriousness. The activities ranged from light kissing at number one to sexual intercourse at number 10. Our pastor asked us to write down the highest number we had reached. After dropping my card in the basket, I filled out the classroom with two friends, and I'll never forget the ensuing conversation. One of my buddies looked over at the other and said, with a wink, so how high did you score, man? My two friends exemplify how clouded our understanding of purity has become these days. We esteem purity too little desire and desire it too late. Even when we try to assert its importance, we render our words meaningless by our contradictory actions. Why are they asking kids in church this? This seems extremely inappropriate and possibly illegal. Two weeks ago, we talked about grooming with you and Russell Anderson. And you know what else is definitely grooming, I think, is adults in positions of authority asking teenager detail, teenagers details of their sexual activity in order to normalize them talking about it. That's weird as and definitely crosses boundaries. Yeah, I would feel weirded out if like a sex ed teacher took this survey. Yeah. I mean, it's it's anonymous cards, but to me, that doesn't really make it any better because to me, this sounds like an adult who is asking children what things they have done and experienced for no reason or for nefarious reasons. I can maybe see where the youth pastor was going with this. I can see a potential of this not being pervy, but I don't like it at all. And I think this youth pastor guy should have known better. I also want to know what he was doing with his data. Is he averaging it? Is he going to tell the youth group, well, your average is a 4.5? You know, when we read... um fundamentalist fear mongering or like a chick comic or something they're like studies show that the average teenager has gone to third base with their significant other maybe this is where they're getting that data from in which uh, the average christian teenager has tried alcohol three times by the age of 17 you know stuff like that right yeah and with the with the youth pastor so either the youth pastor didn't tell the kids in this session of a retreat what he was going to do with the data or he did tell them and Harris left it out of the book but either way that missing piece of information really makes this look pervy or it's something like where asking them to rank it on a one on like a one to ten is something that makes you think about things that you've done so that you can feel bad about it, which also goes back to total depravity and it also goes back to a culture of guilt and shame, which isn't good. Although this does have me going back to friends with seven, seven, seven. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's the other thing that the the more fun thing that came into my mind. (laughs) I also feel like this would be a really annoying survey to fill out because number one, holding hands is not on there. So I don't know if all the good kids were having to write down like 0.5 parentheses holding hands, but I feel like I would have gotten so caught up in the semantics of all of it that I would have had an anxiety attack. Where is side hug on this? That's the question. It's not on the scale. It's not on the scale. That's a problem. I can't repent of my sins. They weren't sinful enough for this one youth pastor that Josh Harris knew. I mean, if if he was Catholic, you know, it would be, you get a one on the scale, you do one Hail Mary. You get a 10 on the scale, you get 10 Hail Marys. I, yeah. I, can I move on to the next quote? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this is another quote about disingenuousness of dating. Um, and he says, I'll never forget a conversation I sat through with a group of guys 
Girls, you would have been appalled if you had overheard it. These guys were discussing the things a guy could do on a date to get a girl to fall for him. He'd take a date to a furniture store, and as he and the girl walked through the displays, he would talk about families and ask which tables and couches she would want for her home someday. (laughs) This is a cute date idea. I don't understand how this is a problem. The idea of dating is that you get somebody to fall for you. I mean, do you, I mean, sure, courtship, blah, 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 purity. But do you not want the person that you are going to marry, the person that you are courting to fall for you is, well, I mean, having read Shannon's book, not really. Look at me, a chump out here. I've been taking my dates to Ikea for the meatballs and not for the... (laughs) Not for the furniture. <laughs> Not for the furniture. Uh, and, and he keeps saying, th- like he says, we cannot practice a lifelong commitment in a series of short-term relationships. Who wants to marry a person who has developed a habit of breaking up and finding someone new when the going gets tough? This is once again coming from a person who has never been in a relationship as an adult, never had sex, not married, 21 years old, and saying a habit of breaking up and finding someone new uh, could be... I mean, that could be his way of phrasing leaving a relationship because they have different priorities or didn't connect emotionally or because they didn't feel like they were being respected, which I think are perfectly valid reasons to leave a relationship. Yes, exactly. Yeah, but that, like, he's, you know, you date people and you find out, oh, this is a deal breaker for me. I can't date somebody who acts in this way because that is contrary to how I want to live my life and the values that I find important. That, I mean, doing that a bunch of times until you get it right isn't a habit if you're being totally reasonable with. Yeah. And well, it's like he it's like he took this reasonable idea of you know, saying date intentionally, saying Christians should respect their dating partners more than people who aren't Christians. That, you know, it's kind of Christian supremacist, but it's not on the scale of toxic Christian things. It's not that bad. <laughs> But when you frame any time you leave a relationship as a habit of breaking up and finding someone new, you're telling people not to leave relationships when things aren't going well. I mean, it seems like he just lives on another planet and has never, doesn't have the personal experience to be able to, to, to know that. I mean, here's another quote from him. He says, dating as we know it is often fueled by impatience and we can directly relate many problems with dating to wrong timing. Once again, these are not problems that like if you aren't in an evangelical Christian relationship, that's primary like, okay, you need to find a wife and get married. You're 22. Like the clock is ticking, man. Like what, what are we doing here? That isn't the same kind of problem, like saying, oh, it's fueled with impatience. I mean, maybe, yeah, if you're, it's impatient, if you're like in your mid thirties and you're like, I still want to have kids the old fashioned way. Yeah. Any thoughts before we take up the offering and move on to what he says are the solutions to the problems with dating? Uh, No, let's get to the solutions. Okay, cool. Hey, Sadie here. If this is your first time listening to the Leaving Eden podcast, make sure you go back and check out episode 57. It's a primer episode for new listeners. That episode tells my personal story and gives you all the terms and information that you'll need to know going forward. Also, check out our cult true crime series, The First Family of Fundamentalism, so that you can get the whole cult story. If you like our show, you can support us by joining our Patreon, where we have extended and uncensored episodes, as well as other bonus content available. You can also join in the discussion in our Facebook group, That group is called Eden Exodus. Tell a friend, tell a family member, tell your worst enemy. The Leaving Eden podcast is a fully independent podcast, and we really appreciate your support. Now, back to the show. We are back from our break. Uh, Can I tell another story here from the chapter called A New Attitude? Oh, please. So Joshua Harris is outlining what he describes as a new attitude, which is essentially him compiling, compiling all of the ideas that had come out before into like purity culture. Jessica, age 16, is a good girl who is unfortunately very naive. Even though she's a virgin and has committed to saving for marriage, she places herself in compromising situations with her older boyfriend, homework at her house, and when her mom's gone, hiking alone, ending their dates in a parked car. 
If Jessica was honest, she'd admit that she likes the excitement of these situations. She thinks it's very romantic, and it gives her a feeling of control over her boyfriend who, to be quite honest, will go as far in their physical relationship as Jessica will allow. But when Jessica takes on a new attitude, she sees that purity consists of more than remaining a virgin. When she honestly examines her relationship with her boyfriend, she realizes that she has left the direction of purity. To get back on course, she has to drastically change her lifestyle. First, she ends the relationship with her boyfriend because they focus on the physical aspect. Then she commits to fleeing those settings that lend themselves to compromise. Where, when, and with whom you choose to spend your time reveals your true commitment to purity. Do you need to examine your tendencies? If you do, make sure that you avoid placing yourself in settings that encourage temptation. (sighs) Why is the solution breaking up with her boyfriend? So I think, he is he telling us that this relationship is corrupted because they focus on the physical aspect and therefore it's a wash and she needs to just get out and start over. Right. Even though she has a boyfriend who it seems like he respects her boundaries when it comes to this stuff. She says, "I we're not going to have sex until we are married. And he says, okay, I'm good with that. And he says, okay, I'm good with that. I'll do As much as, you know, I don't have that conviction, so I'll do as much as you'll let me, but you're in charge. Yes. It, because, so, so Harris says, it gives her a feeling of control over her boyfriend. Is it possible that it doesn't give her a feeling of control? It gives her a feeling of empowerment? That's what I was thinking as well when I pulled this quote. Because I'm, you know, I'm an old married lady, but even when Jonathan and I first got together or, and now when we've been married for almost six years, he respects my physical boundaries, whatever they are. Like from the time we first got together over six years ago now to the time to now, today, he respects my physical body and my physical boundaries and i respect his physical body and his physical boundaries from no thank you to not tonight to not right now to don't do that to my shoulder because i threw it out picking up the kid (laughs) and that's not control that's being empowered and owning your own body you see where i'm going yeah It's not, that is not control over her boyfriend. That is literally just called owning your body and being in charge of it. Jessica in this story doesn't, she has the conviction that she says, I will stay a virgin until I'm married. Okay. If you, if that's your conviction, good for you. Make that choice for yourself. Her boyfriend doesn't have that conviction, but he says, I love you and I respect your boundaries. And even though I don't have this conviction, I guess I'm going to not have sex until we're married because that's the belief that you have. So these two people are going to do the same thing, which Joshua Harris is saying is the correct thing, but for different reasons. And because they're doing it for different reasons, that's also sort of the thing that I see as the problem where he's saying, no, this guy, I mean, if you wanted to, he would do it. He would do it. And so that makes him bad. He doesn't have the same conviction. It's weird because it's like Jesus isn't the thing that's keeping him from doing it. It's his respect for you is the thing that's keeping him from doing it. Therefore, he is bad because Jesus doesn't have the power over his life. Yeah, it's it's not good enough for him to respect your boundaries. But the other point I wanted to make with this was that here's where we start getting the it's not good enough that you don't do it. What you have to do is you have to start policing yourself and never putting yourself in a situation where that could even occur. So you, it's not only don't have sex, it's don't be in a situation where you could have sex. And also that, but don't kiss or hug or hold hands too much because that's going to make you want to have sex, which might put you in a position where you could have sex and then you might slip, trip, and fall into d- and you know what else we get in this one? Don't be alone in the car together. 
don't be alone in the car together. Don't be alone in a house together. It everything becomes a slippery slope. The new attitude uh, trademark is the attitude that Harris outlines here, where it, it, that it isn't just enough that unmarried people don't have sex, and it's not just enough that you avoid any situation where temptation could occur. It's also they must safeguard their emotional purity by not developing emotional intimacy with somebody. And this isn't just because it might lead to sex. It's because emotional purity is as important as physical purity. So that's like what we were talking about earlier with the giving pieces of your heart away and the heartbreak. And I want to compare this to the attitude that was expressed by Jack Hiles. Jack Hiles position was that you shouldn't have a real emotional closeness with anybody, not your wife. While Joshua Harris says that your wife is the only person who you should have this level of emotional closeness with. The thing about this is that if you're only allowed to be emotionally close with one person, then this will cause serious, what I would say are codependency issues, which can be unhealthy, but it totally makes sense that a never married 21 year old boy would mistake like toxic codependency for God giving your marriage like, you know, some special extra juice to make it extra like emotionally high stakes. Mm. And he would see that as something to strive for, not something to be like, oh, maybe this is a bit too much for me. Maybe I should avoid this. The codependency is the thing that he felt when he was with his girlfriend who he had to break up with at 17. So his belief that breaking up with your high school girlfriend is like one of the worst things that could possibly happen to a person is literally just him being unable to deal with the real disappointment in like a mature way because he's 17. And this is further enhanced by the fact that he's writing about his girlfriend from high school that he broke up with when he was 17 as if she were the one that got away four years later when he is a 21 year old. Yeah. And I would point out that most 17 year olds and a lot of 21 year olds are not capable of dealing with real disappointment in a mature way because they are not mature because your brain is not done cooking until you're 25. And that is not like, I hate when we demean the ideas and goals and loves of young adults simply because they're young. It is, it, there is nothing wrong with being young and immature. It's just that you're young and immature and that's a perfectly okay thing to be when you are 17 or 21. At the same time, I remember being that age and I remember, you know, you get a crush, you like try to build yourself up and try to talk to her and try to be like I, I like you do you like me too and she will invariably say no probably because I wasn't that I, I didn't have Riz in high school and then you feel like absolute <laughs> for a little bit and then after a week later you're just like oh wait who's that pretty girl in the back of my class I don't remember seeing her before like th it's always just like oh here there's somebody like when you're that age it feels like it's the end of the world, but then like as soon as it's over, it's like over and you're like, oh yeah, forgot about that. That was fun. That was funny. Huh. And then you look back on it kind of laughably and maybe not everybody is like that, but that's kind of, that was kind of my impression. Joshua Harris uh, quotes Ravi Zacharias telling a long-winded and nonsensical story about marbles and candy, the point of which is that it, unless you are a Christian and in a Christian marriage that is blessed by God, it is impossible to be fully open and vulnerable with your spouse. Very toxic trait. Very toxic uh, teaching. Not a fan of that. Joshua Harris goes on to wax poetic about love, once again sounding like what I imagine Ted Mosby would sound like if he were like a lame prude instead of a weird boy who tells his kids stories about the times that he had three ways here's the quote from him where he says i am by my own admission a hopeless romantic if such a thing is possible i am in love with being in love there's nothing quite like it and if you've experienced it you know what i mean being in love is a patchwork of a thousand indescribable moments nervous energy runs through your body whenever you think of that special person which is every waking minute you lose interest in the dull chores of eating sleeping and thinking rationally you discover that every love song on the radio was written for you it seems that someone has removed the blinders from your eyes 
and you can see the world full of wonder and mystery and happiness. Bro, you're 21 writing this. You've never had sex. You've never been in the, like a real relationship as an adult. This kind of like hyper fixation, I feel like is not sustainable or healthy. See, I think this is fine and normal. Like this is what being in love feels like for some people. The only unhealthy part is getting God all mixed up in your hella fun dopamine rush. The way he's describing it, that definitely is like when I was 17 and had a crush. That's what he's talking about. But the every waking minute of your life to the point where you lose interest in eating and sleeping, that to me isn't healthy. Like if somebody told me that they thought about me constantly to the point where they weren't interested in eating, that would be upsetting to me. And even if I had romantic interest in that person previously, them telling me that would make me lose any interest that I had. For me, that feels more like a manic episode than it does like, oh, I love this person. See, to me, that sounds like very normal new relationship puppy love, and it is fine as long as a person is like the first time it's going to be really rough. But I think healthy people who feel that way about crushes learn how to manage it in a healthy way. It's also weird reading him say these things and write these things when I've read a book by his ex-wife that does not portray their marriage in this way at all. No. Spoiler for next week's episode, but she describes at one point that she can't remember if he had ever looked in her eyes and told her that she was beautiful. That those two things, like these two things, like the real life and the version of love that he's writing in the book don't seem like they're jiving totally to me. But here's a, another quote from that section where he says, to me and other romantics who share a love for love, God wants us. God wants to have a higher, grander view. He wants to deepen our understanding. Romance can thrill us to our core, but it is only a small part of true love. We've been playing in the sandbox. God wants to take us to the beach. And like my thought when he's describing this mania and like this euphoric infatuation is when he puts what he calls loves love on like a pedestal like that. I'm reminded of the conversation that we had with Alora Dodd, um, which like how could anybody forget that conversation when she talked about how fundamentalism just raises the stakes. And I don't think like I don't know how everybody else experiences love, but like in this culture of guilt and shame If you don't get the feeling that Joshua Harris is describing, you might think that maybe you did something wrong or that the Lord isn't blessing your marriage or your relationship in the same way that he should be. If you don't feel this like, I can't think about anything else, I can't eat, I can't sleep, I can't, not a single thought in my brain, I'm like on autopilot because I can't get this person out of my head, you might think you did something wrong. I can definitely see how that could raise the stakes. I think also you could miss if you are the kind of person who does not feel that way when they fall in love, or if you are a a sexual person or a demisexual person or on the aromantic spectrum somewhere and do not experience that exact type of love emotion. If you choose to date people, you could miss a good thing. You know, if you're somebody who wants to get married, wants to find a good partner, but you don't feel those feelings, you could miss somebody who would be a great partner and be the right person for you. You'd be the right person for them because you didn't feel the feeling. Well, and if you're if you're not giving pieces of your heart away before you're sure that you're going to marry somebody, you get close to, you get all the way up to almost engaged, about ready to marry somebody, you don't feel the feeling, but you feel like you got to go through with the wedding because you've given pieces of your heart away, which brings to mind Shannon's mom trying to get her not to walk down the aisle at her wedding. Man, that was a rough read, that part of the book. Say you, you could be going out with somebody and maybe when your style is just like you have more of like a slow build that you it, it you know it takes you a while to really build up those feelings for somebody for somebody and that's a very normal thing to have happen as well 
is that if you're not allowing yourself to be emotionally vulnerable with somebody unless you're married to that person, you might never know if you could even get to that level. But that's what Joshua Harris is is saying here, and it's very like one size fits all, and he puts this thing on the pedestal like that, which I don't think that the thing that he's talking about is necessarily a real expectation that people can have to be like, oh, this is how you live your life now, especially because the person who's writing this book has never had a serious relationship as an adult, has never had sex, is not married, need I go on? So I have another quote here. Uh, can I read this quote? Um, it's about his instructions for women for dress. It's going to be dress, right? It's going to be dress. It's going to be other things, you know, just what? Yeah. Okay. For fun. Um, just reading this quote, I have the sudden urge to read it in Ben Shapiro voice. So either I could traumatize you by doing that or I could not. It's entirely up to you. I, I'm looking at this quote in our notes and I think it's too long. <laughs> can you do like the last paragraph in Ben Shapiro voice? I think I can handle that much. Here's what Josh Harris says. Uh, he says, girls, you have an equally important role. Remember the wayward woman we discussed earlier. Your job is to keep your brothers from being led astray by her charms. Please be aware of how easily your actions and glances can stir up lust in a guy's mind. You may not realize this, but we guys most commonly struggle with our eyes. I think many girls are innocently unaware of the difficulty a guy has in remaining pure when looking at a girl who is dressed immodestly. Now, I don't want to dictate your wardrobe. Yes, you do. But honestly speaking, I would be blessed if girls considered more than fashion when shopping for clothes. Yes, Guys are responsible for maintaining self-control, but you can help by refusing to wear clothing designed to attract attention to your body. TW for me switching into Ben Shapiro voice. I know the world tells you that you have a nice body. You should know. You should show it off. And we men have only helped feed this mentality. But I think you can play a part in reversing this trend. I know many girls who look great in shorter skirts or tighter blouses, and they know it, but they choose to dress modestly. They take responsibility of guarding their brother's eyes. To these women and others like them, I'm grateful. <sighs> End quote. It's gross. Uh, this may be a super controversial hot take, but I almost feel like this version of evangelical modesty culture is more harmful to women than the IFB version. Interesting. <clears throat> because the IFB version, there are guidelines. Don't show this, don't show that, don't do this. And it does make it, I did a whole episode about it recently. It does make it really difficult to dress within the rules, but there are rules. When somebody just says, refuse to wear clothing designed to attract attention to your body, there isn't a rule. And when we get to Shannon's book next week, she was talking about, you know, I was wondering if my jeans were too tight. Personally, I think it's tougher to be allowed to wear jeans, but they can't be too tight because <clears throat> I think it is even more of a focus on it's your body that is the problem than in the IFB. I put this quote here because I was, I want to kind of go into this next section where he talks about like the sort of the way that he views women and the way that he views female relationships with, or, or relationships between men and women, even just like platonic mm -hmm. relationships. And he, he tells a story about meeting a girl at church camp named Chelsea. He, he's kind of interested in her and he asks her to go hang out with him. And after church camp, they begin a long distance correspondence. He becomes very emotionally close with her, sort of blurring the lines between friendship and romantic interest. Very normal thing to have happen. They get more serious, but then the more time they spend together, the less they realize that they have in common. And then Chelsea makes friends with another guy. Joshua becomes jealous. Things sort of fizzle out. And this 
Joshua says is why it's not a good idea to go on one-on-one dates with girls because if they had group dates, then he wouldn't have the emotional intimacy, which is the thing that he says caused all of these problems with his jealousy and him feeling put out because she decided that she wants to be friends with somebody else. So he says that it's important to make sure that your friendships with women stay only friendships and only like surface level. I mean, I have definitely never gotten a crush on somebody that I had only hung out with in a group setting. Not me. That's never happened to anybody. (laughs) Ever. No, the only way that you can have a crush on somebody is if you are one-on-one alone with them and cultivating emotional intimacy. Well, the thing that I think about here is that he is looking at this from a very analytical perspective, and he and he's like the two things that there's two ways that you can be attracted to somebody. You can be physically attracted to someone or emotionally attracted to someone. And if they dress Mm. modestly and you don't get the emotional intimacy, then you won't be attracted to them. Bing, bang, bong. It's man. That's how I would love. Can I get Josh Harris's um, Myers Briggs and Enneagram types from 21 years old and also from now? Because he seems like such a highly logical, analytical person. Like yeah, if you I, hadn't, if he hadn't gotten sucked into this religious community and being a pastor, would he have been like a structural engineer? Because he reminds me of people that I know that are either like super coders or engineers. I had a roommate who was taking an engineering degree. And I see similarities. Can I read another quote here? Sure. So this is a quote from him when when he's talking also about girls again. Um, And he says, when I stopped viewing girls as potential girlfriends and started treating them as sisters in Christ, I discovered the richness of true friendship. That's nice. But he goes on to say, when I stopped worrying about who I was going to marry and began to trust God's timing, I uncovered the incredible potential of serving God as a single. And when I stopped flirting with temptation in one-on-one dating relationships and started pursuing righteousness, I uncovered the peace and power that came from purity. I kissed dating goodbye because I found out that God has something better in store. Dude gets so close to it and then misses the layup like he's so close he's like wait women are people even if i don't want to have sex with them mind blown and then he's like actually you know what i just need to trust god because then he's going to decide who i get to have sex with and then everything's like i'm just like man and then i can treat women as people you're so close to it man you're so close no but like there's just all of these stories in here about like young men who want to get married and and their girlfriends turn out to be Jezebels who like kissing and or their girlfriends leave them for other guys uh, guys you know so like find yourself a girl who doesn't like kissing i guess he tells the story of two young couples one was his friend from high school who had sex with his girlfriend at 16 and they didn't stay together and he used the word love to describe his girlfriend at 16 as like quote unquote justification for having sex with her. He also used the word love to describe his relationship with his eventual fiance, uh, making Joshua Harris very annoyed at him for some reason, because he's like, you can't love two people. You said you loved her and you had sex with her. And now you say you love this person and you're getting married to her. That doesn't make sense to me at all. And then he's telling this other story about this other couple who did it the right way. And they visited Josh and they didn't kiss until they got married. And the point of the story is that he's trying to say that his friend when he was a teenager did not truly love his girlfriend that he had when he was a teenager because if he had then he would not have damaged her relationship with god by having sex with her before they were married and if you truly love somebody then you'll never damage their relationship with god by having sex with them okay There's a lot of just random stories and he keeps bringing up, he, he just co- keeps like name dropping. He's like, you should meet my friend, Travis. Travis didn't have sex until he was 32. And I'm like, man, you're really just like lighting up Travis right now. You're really just putting him out on the limb. Like, I wonder if you got Travis's permission to put his name in your book. Cause Travis is like, leave me out of this, man. Don't, don't, don't say that. Some of these stories are very clearly hypotheticals. Some of them are very clearly intended to be true. There are some that are not super clear. TW for 
uncontrollable urges, rape culture, stuff like that. This because this quote I'm about to read is not great. In the chapter Aphrodite or Christ, Harris basically gives a binary choice invoking the city of Corinth and says, basically, you can all be sinners who use each other's bodies for cheap pleasure, or you can love each other like Christ. And here's the quote. He says, the second common fallacy about love deals with personal responsibility. The world tells us that love is beyond our control. This thinking has found its way into our language. We describe the beginning of a passionate relationship as falling in love. Or people say, we're madly in love with each other. You've more than likely heard people say these things. Perhaps you've even said them yourself. Why do we feel compelled to compare love to a pit or mental disorder? What do these statements have to do with our attitudes about love? Like, bro, just a few minutes ago, you were describing love as being like a manic episode where you couldn't eat, you couldn't sleep, you couldn't think about anything else, literally anything else. He goes on to say, we think of love as something beyond our control and thus excuse ourselves from having to behave responsibly. In extreme cases, people have blamed love for immorality, murder, rape, and many other sins. Okay, so maybe you and I haven't done those things, but perhaps you've lied to your parents or friends because of a relationship. Maybe you pushed your partner too far physically. But if love is out of your control, we can't possibly be held responsible. Yes, we know we behaved rashly. Yes, we know we might have hurt others in the process, but we couldn't help it. We are in love. That's a really gross quote right there. Harris goes on to say, Christ wants us to have a new attitude. He did not say, if you love me, you will feel warm, cascading sensations of religious emotion. Instead, he told us, if you love me, you will obey what I command. True love always expresses itself in obedience to God and service to others. Good feelings are nice, but not necessary. Jesus' example shows us that love is under our control. He chose to love us. He chose to lay down his life for us. So the point he's making here is that Jesus is the thing that proves love is under our control, and Jesus is the thing that prevents us from committing sexual violence against one another, which is, I don't know where any of this stuff is coming from. So I think what he is trying to say is something along the lines of, Love is more than a feeling. Love is both a feeling and a conscious choice that you make to do things for another person, to serve that person, to combine your life with that person, to care for that person. And the feelings are nice, but true love is also commitment. Like there's a difference between being in love and loving somebody <clears throat> why not just say that because I, I, he's i think he's just making that point very badly <laughs> and i think he is also throwing some shade in the same paragraph at people who say oh well you know we had sex before we were married that was bad but we were just so in love like in in his mind that's a thing that people do that's an excuse that people make when they have had sex that they know they shouldn't have had. And he is trying to shoot down that excuse. And at the same time, he's trying to make this point about love being a feeling, but also a choice. And neither one, he's not doing either thing particularly well. So I have a story, a funny story about this concept. When I was at Hiles Anderson, I had been dating a guy. It was getting pretty serious. And we were, we dated for a little bit over a year which in, at Hiles Anderson is very much a big deal. And I suddenly realized that I did very much care for him as a person and love him as a person. But as we were kind of turning the corner and looking toward marriage, it became very clear to me very quickly that I did not feel toward him the way that I wanted to feel for a future husband. I was not romantically in love with him in that way, and I was not attracted to him. And a friend of mine, so I decided, oh, no, I have to break up with this person who I truly, truly care about because I can't be married to this person. And the only options are breaking up or getting married. Um, so I better break up with him. A friend of mine did not like this. She tried really hard to convince me that my feelings of romantic love or attraction did not matter 
because love is a choice. And she thought all I needed to do was choose to love him. And it didn't matter if I felt the feelings that I wanted to feel. It didn't matter if I felt attraction because all I had to do was choose to love him. In my next serious relationship, and we did break up in my next serious relationship after that, I had all of the love feelings and I was only focused on those feelings. And I did not have the commitment. I did not make the choices that I needed to make to sustain that relationship. So I learned through that process, at least for me to be in a good and stable long-term relationship, I need both. I need the feelings. And I also need that commitment that is still there when the feelings are in and out, when the feelings are spotty, when the feelings go away for a week and come back. But I think the love is a choice is what he's trying to say. See, that's a well-made point, and that's a point that makes sense. Yeah, I think I think that's what he's trying to say in this passage, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Because what I'm getting, like you were saying before, he's like, well, people say they love each other and then they have sex with each other and they shouldn't do that because they're supposed to wait till they're married. You can't just use, oh, well, I was in love as an excuse to do stuff. What can you say? I was in love as an excuse to like rape somebody. Can you use, oh, I was in love as an excuse to kill somebody? No. Then why would you use that as an excuse to have sex with somebody if you're not married to them? Huh? Like that that's it. Yeah. That's what he's trying to say. Which is a weird false equivalency to make but if you're in his mind set where it's having sex with somebody that you're not married to is the worst thing that you can possibly do to somebody because it will like it, it is like a fall of purity that they will never live down and it will negatively affect their ability to to love somebody and it will negatively affect all of their relationships going forward no matter what and they will never be able to get fulfillment out of those then yeah sure like whatever but th that's just such a fictitious view to have of this situation it yeah and i think a lot through this book like i said earlier i was so ready to just hate josh harris <laughs> and, but all through this book you see there's a lot of false equivalencies false binaries that don't need to be and it really becomes clear oh this is really how he saw the world at this time and that does not excuse the damage that this book did and the people that this book hurt which is what i'm going to talk about in a minute here after our break but it does, it does help you see why this happened, why he thought that way when he was writing this book as a very young man. To kind of sum up everything that's in this section, because we're going to get to mainly Sadie's conclusions after we take another break shortly. Uh, what Joshua Harris says is the solution for all of the things that you're supposed to be doing is only get into a relationship with somebody if you feel like that's a person that you're supposed to marry and like only get into a relationship as like the direct preface to engagement make sure that you exercise extreme purity rules until the point when you actually get married so with the dress with the um time you spend together shannon harris speaks about this in her book that it she had to go through an even more extreme version of that because it wasn't just that, you know, they had to follow these purity rules. It was that he was also a visible person. So they had to avoid even the appearance of any possible impropriety. Then he's the one putting these ideas into this book. It's also this idea that as an ambassador for Christ, in the world as you will be going out and as you will be doing as a young Christian that you need to also avoid the appearance of any impropriety so that people won't doubt your testimony and doubt anything that you have to say about Jesus and getting people saved because otherwise that would negatively affect them getting saved if they can call you a hypocrite. So that's the most important thing. It's really interesting how this book is just a rehash of all of the same purity culture topics. There isn't, it isn't anything new or innovative with the possible exception that he is actively pushing for something closer to courtship than dating. It was there, it was something about the way that he put it together 
I think it's the way that he wrote to other teenagers and young adults as if he was a peer speaking to peers. I think that was a major contributing factor to the success of this book. But something about the way this old information was presented captured a generation of evangelical kids. So let's take up our second break and then so you've got a lot to say here to kind of wrap this up. Yeah. We are back from our break. Um, Sadie, what are your final thoughts about I Kiss Dating Goodbye? We've heard a lot from the brain of 19 to 21 year old Josh Harris, but what about 22 year old Josh Harris or, or 42 year old Josh Harris? This guy's been through a lot. He was 21 when this book was published, and in 1997, the same year as the publication of this book, he went to Maryland to work under megachurch pastor C.J. Mahaney at Covenant Life Church. We're going to talk about that church a good deal more when we get to Shannon's book next week. Harris was mentored to become the pastor at Covenant Life Church, and he took over pastoring in 2004 and pastored until 2015. He was a well-known pastor within this group of churches, not famous outside his group to the level of somebody like John MacArthur, but he was well-known. He published several books, and he spoke at national conferences for the Gospel Coalition. 2015 was when things started to fall apart for Harris in what I would describe as a good way, and I think he would now too. He had pastored for a decade, but he had never received any kind of seminary training. He wanted to take a sabbatical, go back to school, learn more about Christianity, and take a seminary degree with a broader focus than the part of Christianity that he grew up in or the part that he had pastored in. So he went to a Christian uh, or a theological seminary that has teachers who are Catholic and teachers who are Protestant and teachers from all sorts of different Christian traditions. And um, Captain Crunch, oops, all deconstruction hmm. is what happened at the seminary. So this is, this is where the puns started as like he is, he had an Instagram following from being this well-known pastor and writer and, people knowing who he was from I Kiss Dating Goodbye. And he would announce these changes in his life and people would write about it on Christian blogs and make really funny puns. So when he quit the church to take the seminary degree, Josh Harris kisses megachurch goodbye. It's evergreen. There's going to be a lot of kissing goodbye jokes. (laughs) By 2016, Harris publicly stated that he was reevaluating the book that had made him evangelical famous. He openly invited people who felt that they had been harmed by the book to reach out. So from 2016 to 2018, he accepted story submissions on his website. He took personal phone calls from people and he truly spent time trying to experience all the harm that his book caused he received tweets like, quote, your book was used against me like a weapon. This ended up becoming a documentary called I Survived, I Kissed Dating Goodbye. And this is where we get our second round of jokes um, along the lines of I kissed, I kissed dating goodbye, goodbye, <laughs> which is my favorite. Um, there's, there's a baseball team called the Angels, and they are the Los Angeles Angels, which in sp- the the angels angels oh yes. right okay <laughs> no i get it i was thinking in english only <laughs> so i said at the top that this isn't really a pro josh harris episode or anti josh harris episode of him as a person this is absolutely an anti i kiss dating goodbye episode I want to point out because in in his journey of deconstruction and speaking out against the book, he did some things that I think were great and he did some things that I think were major missteps. 
I want to point out the documentary I Survived, I Kissed Dating Goodbye was released for free. And as part of the process of making the documentary, he made an agreement to take I Kissed Dating Goodbye and other books that he had written on relationships out of publication. And I do think that is a, a big step. I do perceive him as somebody who cares about the harm that he did and cared to try to mitigate it. And then there are times when I think, well, maybe, maybe he didn't get all the way there. I do, I do feel that he cared about the harm that he perpetuated. He did an extensive media tour speaking out about things that he felt he had gotten wrong in I Kissed Dating Goodbye and apologizing to those that were hurt by the message of the book. So when he wrote the book, I'm curious as to how many of the ideas that he put into it were his original ideas. Because the sense I get from reading it is that he had all of these ideas kind of poured into him and he was regurgitating them out. Um, and he got these ideas from either years of Christian homeschooling, from his youth pastor, from youth group, from church camp, from other church leaders. And much of this book is made up of extended and meandering sermon illustrations that like half of them seem like he's repeating a sermon illustration that he heard somebody else say, and it's a big game of telephone. And the other half seem like he's either pulling a story from his life or the life of somebody that he knows, or that it's like told to him under the context of convincing him of some certain thing in particular. It's really hard to know. And I, I can tell you that as part of this documentary and um, so the documentary was a graduate school project from somebody else that went to school with him. And as part of it, he went back through the book and tracked where some of these ideas came from. I was not able to find the documentary to watch online. It was originally released for free, but it was taken down because of things I'm going to tell you in a minute. So the whole idea was of the, the documentary was not only to find what harm this book personally caused people, but what it was that this book contributed to, like the larger canon of work that Harris contributed to. One thing that made me feel more compassion for him at the end of this episode than I had at the beginning was the tagline for the documentary. The tagline was, what if your views on sex and relationships as a 21-year-old influenced millions? And yeah, I, I get that. Um, that would suck. <laughs> that did really humanize him for me. That would be highly unfortunate. But the documentary and the apology tour were still from the perspective of a practicing Christian. So around the time the documentary came out, he did an interview with Premier Christianity in which he said, Quote, I think my writing really lacks nuance and balance, and for a lot of really impressionable young people, it created a sense of real fear, and that had a negative impact on their view of relationships. Yes, there can be regret about past relationships, but this mindset is more helpful. I'm still a complete person, and I'm loved and accepted by God. These choices are not the defining qualities of who I am. In the same interview, he said that he didn't feel that he emphasized grace enough in I Kiss Dating Goodbye. He talked about learning humility and how reevaluating the book felt like losing part of his identity. He talked about how he wanted to focus on other people's pain and the harm caused by his book, but at the same time, he was mourning a loss of part of his identity that he had wrapped up in being a best selling author and in the success of his book. And I really had to sit with this for a minute because it's easy to say, oh, poor you, you feel bad because people didn't like your book, which was bad and hurt people, which is fair. But I don't like when I find out that I've messed up either. Um, I don't like when something that I've done feels like a part of my identity and I find out that it's not as good as I thought it was. I've experienced that and it, it hurt. So I think there's a balance to strike. Um, between sympathy and holding him accountable. By 2019, Joshua and his wife Shannon announced that they were separating. 
And he came out with one more announcement that he was no longer a Christian. And yes, there were more jokes and puns about this, of course. He did make more explicit apologies. So this is a, a quote from a Fox News article, actually from 2019. The former pastor of Covenant Lake Church in Petersburg, Maryland, recounted several things he has apologized for in the past. My self-righteousness, my fear-based approach to life, the teaching of my books, my views of women in the church, and my approach to parenting, to name a few. But there's one group he specifically wanted to add, the LGBTQ community. I want to say that I am sorry for the views that I taught in my books and as a pastor regarding sexuality. I regret standing against marriage equality for not affirming you in your place in the church and for any ways that my writing and speaking contributed to a culture of exclusion and bigotry, Harris wrote. I hope you can forgive me. That feels genuine. I, I believe it is. I really do. And it's, I think, so far so good. And this is when... This is when there there was a misstep that caused people not to be able to trust him. And we're going to talk about that. Post-deconstruction, Josh Harris was doing pretty well in Vancouver, Canada, working in marketing. And in 2021 was when the, the, the misstep was made. <laughs> he announced that he was going to be leading a five-week online course on deconstruction called Reframing Your Story which included an extensive resource list that he called the Deconstruction Starter Pack. He said that this course was for people currently rethinking their faith, people currently deconstructing, and people who want to reintegrate the good parts of their religious past with their current life. He was selling this course for $275. Ooh, inter- I mean, that's a steal compared to Bethany Beal's uh, online course for me. I mean, I wonder if he went to Bethany Beal's online course for online courses. And course he ne- for courses. <laughs> he needed to recoup his money. So he has to charge $275 for his and he has to he only has to sell like six, seven of them in order for mm-hmm. him to. Yeah. Make well, it- he so that's steep he had also neglected to get permission from the people that he listed in the resources for the deconstruction starter pack which was maybe not so good so to his credit he did offer this course for free to anyone who had been harmed by i kiss dating goodbye or any of his other previous work or purity culture as a whole which is a lot of people no proof no application process Go to the checkout for the course and enter a code and the course will be totally free. It turned out that even having a paid option for this course at all rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. And I was there for this. I had a tiny baby the summer of 2021 and I was on Instagram a lot because I had a tiny baby. So I saw this whole thing go down. I was not super bothered by him having a paid option for the course because he offered a completely free option when you wouldn't be missing anything if you did it for free. I think the far bigger misstep was him thinking that he was enough of a deconstruction expert that people would want to spend five years here, five weeks hearing what he had to say. When you put it into time perspective, he was well known in the evangelical world, pastoring, writing, writing a newsletter, writing books from the mid nineties all the way to 2015. That's almost 20 years of upholding purity culture, evangelical culture. And then after only two years of being publicly out as no longer being a Christian, he wants to be the deconstruction expert. And I think that's where he really messed up. People, I think people were just not ready to trust him to lead a deconstruction journey when he had admittedly led so many people astray the other direction. My thought on hearing this is that So he'd only been out as an atheist since like 2019 and he came out with this course in 2021. Yes. 
But after having read his wife's book, I know that things started to really shift for them. And they started really questioning things when the allegations came out about Covenant Life Church, which was many years or which I think was about a decade or 2011, 2012, something like that. That sounds right. It's fair to say that deconstruction isn't just doesn't begin when you decide, oh, I don't believe in God anymore. And deconstruction might not even involve somebody saying, I don't believe in God anymore. But I think that where a lot of this comes from is people very fairly, I think, thinking you hurt me. And now you're like, and now you just get to like go off and live your life and, you know, other people are going to listen to you. I I do think that's where the anger was coming from that was aimed at him. And I can sympathize with that. I think it's, it's really, I can sympathize with the anger. I can also really appreciate the transparency that he has worked with for al- almost 100% of the time um, has been transparent, vulnerable, given real apologies, and appeared to be very committed to repairing the harm that he caused. I think he does understand that that is going to be a very long process. Um, I don't think I don't think he takes it lightly. I think we can all underestimate the harm that we've done in our lives. I think that's human. I don't think that makes him a bad person when he has made mistakes and underestimated the harm that he did. After the backlash about the course, he also refunded everyone who had paid for the course and canceled the course. Uh, He does seem to be committed to actions that repair when he does make mistakes. The Reframe Your Story homepage, the homepage for this course said, Quote, what if you stopped needing to have all the answers and learn to live with uncertainty and mystery? That line makes me feel like he was headed in the right direction. And it also, I think, makes clear why people did not want to listen to him personally talk about this, because he spent over 20 years proclaiming that he did have all the answers. I think people were just still mad. And I think they had every right to be. The thing that this makes me ask is what, con- especially for somebody in the public sphere, what constitutes a redemption for them? What does that entail? Because there's always going to be a certain number of people that are just going to hate you no matter what. And who mm-hmm. are just going to say, you did this thing that I didn't like. This is so bad. I can never forgive you for doing this thing or for no matter what you try to do, you're never going to be able to gain redemption in their eyes. I like, I don't know. I think that if you're somebody like him, then you just kind of have to accept that no matter what it is that you do, there will always be backlash and you're not going to be able to please everybody. And you're not going to be able to even get everybody to forgive you for the things that you've done that are wrong. Yeah. And I don't want to, I don't even want to use the term cancel culture because that term has become so overused and fuzzy. But when someone who is a public figure has made a mistake, it comes to light. I am pro bringing those mistakes to light, even when it's me, even though that hurts. I I hate it every time I make a mistake and somebody talks about it on the internet i hate it um but i would it it is the right thing to do to try to correct those mistakes i think there also has to be like you said a path to redemption i was reading um about restorative justice and that is a principle in restorative justice is that the path to fixing it can be a very if if the harm that you have done is big the path to fixing it is going to require a lot but that there it is always with the mindset of we are going to try to fix what was broken and i do think i think it's a positive sign that harris was willing to take a step back 
when people told him when, when he released this course and there was a huge backlash that he was willing to just, okay, no, we won't do that rather than trying to push ahead and you can't tell me what to do. I think he shows some humility in 2024. He's dabbling in the deconstruction space, not trying to make any money off of it. As far as I can see, he does podcast interviews here and there, and he promotes his own podcast online, which is not a podcast about deconstruction. We listened to an episode of it and we're like, Ooh, we have to figure out what's on the, and nothing's on there. It's, <laughs> it's, it's just talking. a bros talking to bros podcast. It's like a bros talking to bros about having kids. Like it's, it's nothing. It's there's nothing on there. I couldn't even tell which one he was when I was listening to it. I'm like, which one of these guys is Josh Harris? Whose words am I supposed to be paying attention to and parsing for every tiny little detail about his life that I can put into a podcast episode? And so we are bros talking about bros talking to bros. (laughs) Yep. And then in the end, this is it. Josh Harris is really interesting to me. He has shown himself committed to the process of making amends and seeking restoration after the harm that he unintentionally did to others. He's made real apologies, and I think he has done some actual work. I think, I suspect that he's truly committed to doing whatever he needs to do to be accepted in the deconstruction community, but I also think he takes that eventual acceptance for granted I don't, the the one, uh, and respect to all the work that he has done, because I do see evidence of him having done the work in his life. I think maybe the part he hasn't done is realizing that the acceptance that he want, he wants is not guaranteed. And I think that attitude is what rubs people the wrong way. He's, I think he's aware of the harm he's caused, and I respect that. I think he's aware enough to know it'll be a long journey to for people in the deconstruction space to trust him. And I respect that. Th- those are steps that a lot of people never make. But I think, I suspect that he assumes that the end of his journey will be acceptance and having a large platform again. And my opinion is that that's what gets under people's skin. I... I'm not yet not here to love him or hate him. I think he's a great case study in what it means to try to undo harm that you helped cause. That was very well put. Um, and that's all we've got for today's episode. Next week, we will come back and talk about the book, The Woman They Wanted, which is Josh Harris's ex-wife's memoir. It was incredible. Um, Holy cow, I cannot wait to talk to you about that book. If we were doing a tier list of deconstruction books, I would put this on the same tier as probably like lovingly abused. Like it was that good. Not quite as funny. <laughs> it wasn't as funny as lovingly abused, but it was like as f- the what I feel was very rare about this book was that you don't very often see a mega church pastor's wife writing a deconstruction memoir and that was really cool to see yeah and it's it's a lot more i thought it was just going to be a tell all about being married to josh harris and not at all she gives us plenty of details and information that are helpful to understanding what that was like but it is not just a gossip book it is way more than that honestly josh is barely in it but yeah i don't think he was in i think he was barely in the marriage (laughs) Thank you guys for tuning in to today's episode. We hope that you guys enjoyed it. Um, So join us next week when we read uh, The Woman They Wanted and we review that book and talk about that book for you guys. Highly recommend you guys check it out. But if you don't want to read that book by the time we'll talk about it on our uh, episode next week, you can follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at Leaving Eden Podcast. Um, You can follow me on socials at G-A-V-R-I-E-L-H-A-C-O-H-E-N, Sadie. You can follow me on Instagram at Sadie Carpenter Music, on Twitter at Hell Yes Sadie, and on TikTok at Sadie Carpenter One. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. You have a great day. Bye-bye. Red
that's no confusion, there'll be no pollution. I'm so thankful I've decided to change my ways. I'm so thankful I decided.